Hello and welcome to Bondcast, a podcast series where we discuss our views on the latest themes and events shaping rates markets. I'm Imogen Bakra, Head of Non-Dollar Rate Strategy, and I'm joined today by our Global Market Specialists, Jan Levrizi and Joanne Spadigan. Okay, some big market moves and the week ahead of obviously big central bank meetings as well. So I think we'll probably spend most of the time today kind of digesting what what we think or what we're expecting from those. Um, Jan, I'll go through them chronologically. So I'll start with you in in the US. It's a Fed meeting next week, uh, last one of the year. Um, Are we expecting anything exciting from that? So Fed meetings are always exciting, but uh, the (laughs) the, the, the extent of this one could be limited. However, you're not going to get much in terms of fireworks from what they can deliver, right? I think it's, uh, I would say there's four key points I'm, uh, I'm looking for at this main meeting. First and the most obvious one is they're probably done with the, with the hiking cycle. Uh, they're not going to change the, the interest rate from, uh, from their current range of 525 to 550. Uh, and that's been pretty well communicated, I think, at this point, which uh, I think it doesn't necessarily officially mark the end of the cycle, but I think unofficially it's pretty clear that the hurdle to raise another again is uh, is huge, and I'll get back to that in a second. So that's one. Uh, second, this is a uh, this is another kind of like a quarterly meeting where we get their summer of economic projections. The Fed uh, releases those uh, every other meeting, so once a quarter, and uh, and you would see the in those they have what where they expect the median Fed funds rate to be at, well, where they expect the unemployment growth. Uh, inflation and so on, a bunch of different uh, economic forecasts that each uh, FOMC official submits, and then they aggregate those. So uh, we think those will actually be reflect, those will have to reflect uh, this year's reality that they're actually not hiking again. So we will see that coming down from uh, 5.6 to like 5.375, the median of the current, uh, sorry, the middle of the current range. you know, because there's simply more meetings left in the year to hike it. However, uh, we think next year could be reflected to show one uh, less, uh, one fewer cuts. So that would go to 4.875, uh, which uh, which kind of is consistent with their idea that they want to set the markets to higher for longer. We're not going to rush into hiking, but uh, you know, I think the hawkish surprise could come there if they. Had something along the lines of only one cut, or if they, I don't think they can get there, but what if they had something of zero cuts penciled in for next year? Uh, again, this is just like the hawkish scenario. And I think if they left the next year's uh, projection unchanged at 4625, then then that will be, uh, that, would, that would lean dovish for markets. That's second. Uh, the third is the policy statement. There, we expect, or I should say, we don't expect major changes to the policy statement. Uh, maybe some of the wording. Uh, could could be adjusted to say that more policy tightening could be needed if uh, conditions warrant rather than that they expect to t- tighten more. Uh, but again, the hurdle there is very, very high. Uh, I think it's going to be extremely hard for the Fed to come back with the labor market obviously showing some signs of deceleration, uh, with inflation showing, um, I guess at this stage, you can say consistent sign of moderation. It's going to be very hard to come back into the market and, uh, and or at least come back and hike again. And finally, the, uh, the, the summary of economic projections, or SCP, uh, we think will show uh, reductions in what they expect for inflation to be in 2023, 2024. It's, of course, a very welcome development, but uh, we don't expect major changes in unemployment or, or growth. If anything, I would imagine the unemployment forecast could be nudged slightly higher, uh, which is kind of one of our view of why uh, we think the Fed's going to come in and start cutting in May and 50 basis point increments. And it's funny because, and I'm not trying to sidetrack a lot here, but it's funny because a couple of weeks ago when we had our year ahead and before we had this monstrous rally in the, in the treasury curve, you know, our view for a May rate cut was seemed a little outlandish and it was just kind of like, a, oh, well, that's too soon. How can you do about it? And now the market's priced in uh, basically above 35 basis points for May. You know, everyone, not everyone, but like a lot of people are now a lot more on board with the idea. So it's just a classic example of how uh, price drives the sentiment. I think that's a very fair point when we think about our year ahead views. You know, the most off consensus that we had were a that the Fed can cut in May and cut as much as we were expecting, and and b the ECB view as well that we thought that they could cut as early as March. I mean, for a long time, 
uh, people were kind of laughing about the door with that view. And as you say, in the last couple of weeks, um, they've come much, or the market, at least market pricing has come much, much more on side with that. So just as an overall kind of takeaway for markets, do you expect this to be a particularly hawkish or dovish take on the meeting? And I ask this because I think that how the market views the Fed's reaction function is quite important for how it thinks about the BOE and the ECB. You know, one of the, we'll come on to the ECB in, in a sec anyway, but one of the big pushbacks that we've had against the ECB going as soon as March is this idea that they can't cut, um, you know, hugely early or they won't cut hugely earlier than the, than the Fed are. And so I think that, you know, in some ways more than what the ECB tell us next week or the Bank of England tell us next week, markets will take more of a lead from from what they think they're learning from the Fed, um, even for for other regions. I don't think it will be a particularly dovish meeting, just because we've, uh, even if they intended to be a little bit softer in the message, uh, we've rallied so much and, you know, what they quote as financial conditions, generally perceived as some combination of interest rates, equities, uh, currencies and credit order, you can add a bunch of different variables, but a lot of these financial conditions that are financial indicators that uh, should be reflecting what's the you know, overall level of stress in the system, uh, those have loosened a lot. We've seen interest rates coming down substantially. We've seen equities doing pretty well. You know, credit spreads are pretty, doing again pretty well. To give that in context, that's like the, how the Fed or any central bank really applies its uh, forward-looking measure, right? Like they they will adjust overnight interest rate, but the what really matters for the economy, for the most part, isn't overnight interest rate. It's mostly how the the term structure looks like in interest rate. So everything's come down a lot, and I think because of that, they there's a limit on how dovish they can be. But that being said, again, I think it's underappreciated point is how much the rhetoric shifted as we were heading into uh, the quiet period that the Fed is in right now. We'll see on Friday the payrolls might add a little bit more to that, although we do expect a rebound there because of uh, returning strikers now that the UIW strike has been has been resolved. But imagine if that comes weak and unemployment actually shows further increases. I think now you're kind of getting to the territory where you have to start seriously asking yourself the question. We know inflation is on a consistent path downward, uh, but at the same time, we don't know once unemployment gains traction, uh, what's what's to stop it, right? Like if you get to four and a half percent, why would you stop there? And the momentum in unemployment tends to be pretty strong. And uh, as a reminder, I mean, this is something post uh, inflation we don't really talk about, and I'll finish with that. But uh, you know, alongside the fate uh, adjustment or like the policy review for uh, for the Fed, uh, you know, like the flexible average inflation targeting, the the approach towards unemployment was changed as well, where uh, undershoots in unemployment. So weakness in unemployment will not be tolerated, but strength in unemployment. So fewer people unemployed is okay. They're not going to try to balance that out. So it's only one-sided approach. Uh, and I think once we start seeing this momentum consistent in unemployment, the reaction function will change pretty quickly. So let's see what Friday brings. But I think the bar on, um, or at least the floor and how dovish you can get is there also, but I don't think they're going to try to push back too much against this market. Yeah, I think that's an important point about unemployment as well, because, again, one of the pushbacks that we got against the Fed view was that Fed cuts that early or to that extent would imply a kind of hard landing scenario, which we don't necessarily have in our sort of base case for US GDP next year. But actually, we do have unemployment rising to relatively high levels. And like you say, that has been a trigger in the past for a change in their reaction function. And I think it's easy certainly for us in the UK and the euro area to forget that the Fed also has a dual mandate. It's not just targeting price stability like the Bank of England and, and the ECB are. Okay, before we move on to the ECB, um, just want to quickly touch on uh, money markets and, and kind of repo funding in, in the US because they've also, aside from all the other big market moves that, that we've had this week, there's been some discussion of stress in, in funding markets in the US with software jumping quite unexpectedly after month end. We usually expect big moves kind of around that month end turn. Um, is that something that you're worried about or that you think that we should be worried about? So I think there's a couple of things there that are interesting. To start with, uh, it did jump on uh, month end, but not as much as we would expect from general collateral repo. Uh, it only went to 533 uh, as, a, as opposed to normal inter-dealer broker markets, which were showing rates as high as 550. So we expected a little bit of, uh, of a steeper jump in month end. 
But what was surprising was the day after Montag, when the rate jumped to 539, the day after that, 537, now it's back to 533. Uh, and I'm giving these numbers not so much as like uh, absolute levels matter as much, but the six base point jump was kind of unseen in the history of, or at least like you know, post-COVID history of SOFR, uh, because we are still assuming that we're operating under a system of ample reserves and uh, still a decent amount of excess liquidity. Uh, so that was surprising. I don't think it, uh, given how it's retracing, it should be too worrying, but it could have, or volatility in that spread could have uh, implications for any form of funding trade, such as the treasury-based trade that is very popular. So that's one. Uh, the second thing is, I think it will, actually, month of December will be relatively uh, okay for funding. For the first time in a long time, Treasury, the U.S. Treasury is paying down Treasury bills. Uh, I would say first time since uh, June, we're going to get some like more sizable pay downs. So uh, that injects liquidity technically back into the system as auction sizes have been lowered. So that will support uh, you know overall funding conditions. Uh, and I would expect so to continue tracing, particularly in the second part of the month when these uh, GSEs come back and start lending cash as well. Uh, so we could even see that rate going down to 531 below the, the federal funds, effective federal funds rate. Uh, and finally, an interesting dynamic has been, and something that uh, if market participants should look should be looking out for, is that the, the rate that money market funds can get in tri-party right now has moved to 531, which is one basis points above what the overnight RRP rate. And the reason I'm mentioning is that uh, the overnight RRP facility has been so popular in just general news and just uh, overall financial commentary that... Uh, a pickup over that could allow money funds to move away from there and come into private markets and just pick up the extra basis point. We haven't seen that so far uh, because maybe given the absolute level of yields, a basis point pickup is simply not uh, worth the operational hassle, but they're not extending duration and there is a pickup to be made there. So if you see outflows from that facility, I would imagine it's because of, uh, because of that. Uh, finally, it, I don't think, given how quickly we're retracing, and there really haven't been any like big profile blowups or anything like that, I think there is a, the case to be made that the Fed could adjust its technical rate, so not the overall interest rate, but cut the rate that it pays on overnight RRP from 530 to 525 and bring it to a historically more consistent range and uh, use this as like an opportunity to normalize. It might not be this meeting's, uh, you know, it might not happen in this meeting, but over the next couple of meetings, if we keep seeing these pressures, uh, I'll be looking out for uh, for that type of tweak. And do you think the market would interpret that as anything other than what it really is, which is, I suppose, just a kind of technical adjustment? Do you think the market would, you know, in this environment where we're kind of biased to believing everything, you know, yeah. that points to central banks cutting much sooner than we were expecting? Would that be viewed as a first step towards easier monetary policy or not? I mean, I'll try to do my duty in this as much as I can to try to explain the nature of it and that it's not an actual cut and it's a, a really a technical adjustment because what's going to move from that is only specific rates. It's not going, you're not going to see uh, like the effective Fed, Fed funds moving. You're going to see SOFR moving. You're going to see maybe some bills performing well. But you're not going to see the whole curve being influenced by that because it's simply uh, lowering the floor of the rates and kind of the floor has a pull to it, but uh, but it's not just like a a shift in approach to where the the target remains the same, five twenty five to five fifty. They just want to uh, be able to fine tune interest rates within that band. Uh, so I think there will certainly be news about the Fed cutting, uh, but they're not actually cutting interest rates; they're just tweaking. Uh, a policy tool that's used to keep interest rates where they want them to be. Okay, makes sense. All right, let's switch over to the ECB then. I mean, we alluded to, to the fact earlier, Joanne, that, you know, we've had this more dovish view than um, most of the streets, I think, for a long time now. You've defended it quite well and quite frequently on this podcast. Um, you know, this idea that we thought the ECB could cut as, as soon as March next year, and especially over the last two weeks, markets have come much more on side. Um, what do you, what are you really looking for next week then, I suppose, to raise your conviction around that view? So I think in terms of next week, the key focus really will be on the forecasts 
We've been talking about this for a while now, but we do expect that both the growth and inflation forecasts for the ECB next week will be revised downwards. Uh, and the URI inflation print last week at 2.4%, both the expectations of 2.7%, really confirmed the story in Europe that inflation is moderating and perhaps quicker than, uh, than expected. So I think that kind of reduction of the forecast will be what the key focus is for next week. And I think that will come with this sort of confirmation that early rate cuts are still very much a play and could well happen, uh, given what the uh, forecasts are likely to be. Uh, I do think that uh, in terms of where we see things next year, the market's obviously moved fairly in line with what we've said so far. Uh, close to 25 basis points is being priced in for March. Uh, and I think kind of 100 basis points has been exceeded and 140 has been priced in for the whole year. Um, so I think things have moved fairly quickly on side with what we're thinking. Um, I think one of the more interesting things from this week, at least, was the ECB Shabo, where she sort of um, mentioned that actually the, the door for further hikes is closed. And, and she does see uh, that as being the case. In the past, she obviously hasn't stated that and has always stated that rate hikes could come. So I think that has been seen to be a pretty big shift from one of the more hawkish members of the committee. But I do also think at the same time that the market really is looking for and, and, and looking for specifically dovish shifts from various central banking members. Like uh, there's been a reaction to Valois' comments last week, uh, which really noted that actually rate cuts could come in 2024. And that's not necessarily a new story, given that forward guidance has indicated that uh, rates will stay elevated for at least a couple of quarters, but it does seem to be the markets really are keen to find any reason to turn dovish. And the data supports it and the ECB next week, I think, should really confirm that bias for now, at least. And the other thing I suppose that uh, we'll be focused on heading into next week will be any potential discussions around balance sheet reduction. There have been a couple of headlines around that in the next, sorry, in the last couple of weeks. Um, uh, it feels like that is ramping up, I suppose, the, up the priority list as we perhaps get nearer to the timing of those first rate cuts. How are you thinking about that next week specifically, and then perhaps more broadly into next year? I think in terms of PEP, we've obviously had uh, ECB sources article recently that did highlight that it could be up for discussion in uh, December. And I do agree that, that the ECB could well start discussing or talking about PEP once again in December. Um, but it does seem to me... Uh, that the decision will not come this side of the of the year. I really expect that you know December markets with low liquidity, um, not really any strong consensus around PEP being decided on and agreed on, and um, this sort of told to the market in December, um, along with sort of January supply, which tends to be fairly heavy. Um, it doesn't seem to be the perfect time for the ECB to make uh, or communicate to markets at least their decision on PAP. So we do think that whilst they'll discuss it um, and might even communicate in the press conference, for example, to the market that they have discussed it, that a decision will not come until uh, early next year. Obviously, one of the reasons why the ECB didn't talk about PAP uh, at the last meeting was a lot of volatility with BCB Bund, obviously, uh, widening quite a lot. And BTB, BTB Bund is in a bad position at this point. It's at 175 basis points. So, so really that kind of relief in BTBs could mean that the ECB is less uh, risk averse in terms of at, least, of at least addressing that they have discussed PEP in their formal discussions. So I definitely think we could see um, some sort of discussion around PEP coming out in the press conference, but I don't really expect a decision until early next year. And our timeline on that remains fairly uh, similar to before. So we still expect PEP, a decision on PEP to come in the early part of next year and the start with a gradual roll-off in the middle of the year. Um, I think on the other sorts of tools, uh, MRR and uh, the remuneration of government reserves as well, I as, again don't expect a decision on this part, uh, on this side of the year. I really expect that that will be rolled into the operational framework review and that that's what uh, will come out um, in the early part of next year. Um, that's it for me on the euro area side, but let's move to the UK now. Um, so Imogen, the Bank of England appears to have been pushing back more heavily against the recent market pricing. Uh, how do you expect to be, that to be reflected uh, in the meeting next week? Yeah, I think in some ways, of course, this is probably famous last words when it comes to the Bank of England, that um, next week's meeting should be um, uneventful, hopefully. Um, and certainly there's less scope for it to be eventful than, say, 
um, the Fed or the ECB, given that it's not one of the quarterly projection meetings, it's not a monetary policy report. So we don't get an updated view of the Bank of England's forecast um, and there is no press conference. So there's only a couple of ways really in which they can uh, drive a, a market reaction. The first of all is, of course, on you know their decision around uh, policy, you know, whether they deliver tightening or, or easing, in fact, as I suppose we might start thinking about. Um, both seem particularly unlikely <laughs> next week. I think tightening is probably more likely than easing, uh, but but neither are our base case and markets are very much in line with that pricing. So then it comes down to, you know, the other elements, the vote, the guidance um, and any tone around kind of recent data prints in the minutes. Um, on the guidance, I, it seems like there's a fairly high bar at the moment for the Bank of England to adjust their current forward guidance that they have around, you know, if we see uh, further uh, pressure, persistent price pressures, then we will have to tighten monetary policy further. That's not exactly word for word what they say, but that is the uh, essence of, of the line. You know, they had that same kind of forward guidance when they surprised markets by hiking 50 basis points in June. And they had the same guidance when they didn't hike in September. So the bar to, to change that, uh, particularly against a backdrop of them, you know, consistently warning over the last couple of weeks about the upside risks and about how they're not you know, ready to kind of claim victory, if you like, on this fight, fight against inflation feels pretty high. So then really, we're just left with the um, minutes and the vote. The vote, I expect, will be the same as it has been for the last couple of meetings. So you get six members in favour of no hike um, and three dissenters for a 25 basis point hike. I think those three dissenters are probably the same that we've seen in, in the last meeting. Um, so you have Green, um, Haskell and Mann voting for, for a 25 basis point hike. The risk here is that you get, and I think this could actually be what might reasonably drive a market reaction, um, is you could get someone like Pill, for example, uh, perhaps voting for a hike. He's been pretty clear in his recent communication that the decision is very finely balanced. Um and I think if you were to get a 5-4 vote for um, unchanged rates, then that would drive uh, a bigger market reaction. You know, I think we could be looking at something like 10 to 15 basis points higher um, in yields there. Um, if either Peel or you know, potentially Ramsden opted to vote in favour of a hike. But again, I as ascribe a relatively low probability to that scenario, I think, you know, if I would say there's something like an 80% likelihood that you still get a, a 6-3 vote. Um, and so then it's it's just the minutes. And I think the minutes probably reflect a somewhat hawkish tone. There's clearly going to be a whole other round of data next week. And, and the Bank of England's take on that will all be reflected in the minutes. But I expect them to repeat what we've heard recently around you know, service inflation still being very high, still being sticky, um, wage inflation remaining very high and sticky, and a lot of the disinflationary pressures that we've been seeing, you know, it's very different in the UK than in the euro area, where it's very broad based fall in inflation. In the UK, we're really just talking about food and energy price inflation coming off. And I expect them to, to emphasize um, their concern or, or caution. Um, uh, around that and around this, the potential upside risks that, that they're still seeing. And I suppose in terms of markets, how do you think markets kind of digest that and what does it mean for the markets? So if if our base case materialises, you know, no, no change in rates, 6-3 vote um, for unchanged rates, slightly hawkish tone to the minutes, but no change to forward guidance, I think that that is pretty close to consensus and I would expect that to be somewhat uneventful from a market perspective. I don't see that being particularly market moving at all. Um, you know, the market has so far paid very little attention to what the BOE has been telling them in recent communications. I think nearly all BOE members have struck quite hawkish tones, more haw a more coordinated hawkish message from BOE members than we're hearing from other 
central bank speakers, you know, when you look at the ECB and the Fed, I think there's a, a wider range of views there. And of course, it's easier in some ways for the BOE to have a slightly narrower range, given that there's fewer of them, but that hasn't stopped, the, you know, there being quite divergent views in the past. And I think we're seeing a very coordinated pushback across the MPC. And the market so far has paid little attention to that. So um, it's difficult for for me to see that even if they struck a kind of a much more hawkish tone than we're expecting in the minutes, um, that that would really be a, a major driver of, of a market reaction, because I think markets just don't buy into what the Bank of England are, are telling them right now. Um, and, you know, if, like I say, I think perhaps the vote will be watching closely and any changes to the forward guidance, but, but it's really not our base case. You know, we have our central scenario with, unlike in previous Bank of England meetings where it's felt like a much closer call, um, we have our, our central scenario with, with quite high probabilities, kind of 80% probabilities. So um, although there, there are some sort of market moving outcomes that are possible, um, they feel relatively unlikely to us. Um, I think, you know, gilts have moved a lot in the last couple of weeks, largely being driven by a lot of what has been happening elsewhere. You know, ECB members opening up the door to easing earlier than we were expecting, Fed speakers doing the same, data elsewhere turning more clearly. You know, like I say, if you look at euro area data, there's not a lot of news or new information domestically that we, you, you would think has fundamentally changed the backdrop for the Bank of England. And so although markets are now pricing closer to our base case when it comes to the Bank of England's reaction function next year, we have 100 basis points of cuts in our central scenario. Markets are about 90 basis points of, of cuts being priced in now. Um, I still think that the risks in the near term are are back towards higher rates. I think this kind of bid for duration and rally across the curve has just um, gone a little bit too far now and we're kind of at, at stretched levels. And I think that we are due um, a bit of a reversal. Um, but, you know, heading into the end of the year with markets still ignoring um, a hawkish central bank speak, it might take a more meaningful return of supply in the new year, for example, to, to get that back up in rates to come. Um, but yeah, that's probably enough. Um, we will catch up next week after all these central bank meetings for the last bondcast of the year, and then we'll take a short break into the new year. Um, thank you both for joining me. Thank you to our listeners for listening in. And just a reminder, if you liked today's episode, please don't forget to hit the like button and click subscribe so you can get the latest episodes as soon as they're available. Thanks. See you next week.